Resident Evil sucks ass. That's not hyperbole, and it's not being provocative for the sake of it. Resident Evil just plain sucks ass. Capcom is just churning out game after game in the most cynical way imaginable, just throwing it at the wall and hoping something sticks. And if it doesn't, they'll just scrape all that shit off the floor and make something out of it anyway. Half of the new releases consist of remakes now, because originality is dead, and there was a legion of nostalgic fucks like me out there wistfully reminiscing about what once was, and dreaming about how we could come back again better than ever. Except this is 2024 now, baby! And you can bet your bottom bitch that quality isn't the name of the game. It's all about plopping out the next half-assed product for the consumers lined up with their feeding maws wide open. I've said it a while ago now, but Resident Evil consists mostly of things I hate at this point. I'm talking games, movies, horrible miscast live-action series, you name it. I used to at least love the characters, but... Oh, baby, Capcom made sure to end that. I think I remember cutting RE2 make a lot of slack when it came out. Would I have preferred a fixed camera and tank controls? Hell yes. But the gameplay they went with still felt fun and intense, and they did an excellent job making zombies feel intimidating again. But holy sh**, the more I think about what they did with the characters, the more I despise it. They're not all bad, mind you. Sherry was well written and easy to sympathize with, as were Marvin and Kendo. And you know what? I got no beef with Leon aside from one or two little moments. Claire, however, is a loud, foul-mouthed, overly aggressive, two-dimensional, strong female character girl boss who badly needs a personality transplant. Irons, likewise, had all the interesting aspects of his character stripped away in favor of being cartoonishly evil from the second he appears on screen. I can't believe this fat, mustache-twirling fuck ever convinced anyone he was a normal, trustworthy human being. Remake Irons was probably voted most likely to craft a human skin suit in high school, whereas the original version had a slow build-up to his insane behavior. But hey, it's 2024, as I said, and Subtlety was shot dead in the streets years ago, probably during a mostly peaceful protest of some kind. And let's not forget the boneheaded choice to change Ada's cover story, thus severing the callback to RE1, because in a series with continuity as carefully constructed as a fucking Jenga tower, why not haphazardly yank out a brick and chuck it out a damn window without opening it first? You know what? Yeah, about that continuity. There's never been any. The number of times I've been um actually in YouTube shorts with corrections is staggering. Um actually baffled. According to Leon A. Claire B., so and so never happened, therefore, shush! Sh just sh shut the fuck up. Capcom will contradict you in a heartbeat because you care more about the story than they do. There is no Resident Evil canon. That's why Chris, Jill, Barry, and Rebecca all survive in the Spencer Mansion, even though that's literally impossible in both the original game and the remake. Did nobody ever think that was weird? And sure, let's tack on Zero as a prequel so the timeline makes even less sense. Then there's RE2, where Leon and Claire barely interacted at all, unless you ask the writer of Degeneration, who went out of their way to show them in a flashback, running through the streets of Raccoon City together while toting shotguns and merrily blasting zombies away, because that definitely happened. Then Tumake comes along and makes it even more unclear who did what and when, even though it was a perfect opportunity to clean up the timeline. Nah, can't be bothered, just half-ass the B-scenario instead. The Capcom approach to storytelling is so brain-dead that according to a producer of RE4 make, Operation Javier is canon, but oh, except not really though. Well, like, it happened, but it didn't happen the same way fans experienced in the freaking game that it's from. So like, really, Operation Javier as a nebulous concept totally, definitely happened, somehow and in some way that will never show you because fuck you. Okay, maybe I paraphrased the guy a little, but I'm not far off, damn it. But I got sidetracked, I think. What else haven't I mentioned yet? Sh should I even bother with 3 make? Ah, oh, fuck it, I will. Let's take the most intimidating monster from the entire classic series and water him down to a handful of scripted events because the general gaming audience wet their pants too much over Mr. X and 2-make. Oh, plus this was the start of the cuntification of Jill Valentine, a process they finally completed in Death Island. But that's a bag of ass for a different day. Because yeah, I'm gonna kick that cursed can as far down the road as possible. I actually had very few problems with 4-make, though. They sent Leon to dad joke rehab and got his head on straight so I didn't have to groan every time he opened his mouth. Unlike OG RE4. Although that Nick Apostolides putz did fight to get some of those dumbass lines put back in. Good riddance to him. 
but they did away with most of the overly cheesy bullshit from the original RE4 and made a more serious, more engaging story. Even gave the villains some well done and much appreciated backstory. Although changing Krauser's role in the plot was kind of a dumb move, but I can mostly forgive it. And I like how he's the one that takes out Luis now. Sure, I hated shit like the stationary Gigante that existed only to throw rocks, but it wasn't enough to stain the whole game for me. Then Separate Ways comes around and basically consists entirely of dumb cheesy shit that I thankfully didn't spend a penny on because I'll be damned if I'm gonna pay for the privileges of hearing Lily Gao fail to sound like an actual human being. Again, I mean, it takes someone special to fuck up the same character in two entirely different mediums with so little time, so congrats I guess, you're gonna sweep someday at the Razzies. Slay Queen. Fucking hell, Separate Ways. In the original game, I actually preferred Separate Ways to the main story, but damn did they flip that for the remake. I guess that's not a terrible thing. At least 4 makes main story was a good experience. But Capcom really does need to actually f do something with the character of Ada Wong, aside from continuing to use her as a dollar store Catwoman femme fatale cardboard cutout. The character never progresses in any way. She's a shitty person, doing mostly terrible things, and being let off the hook again and again by Leon, who at this point is probably able to bounce around on his blue balls as a convenient mode of transportation. Never mind the fact she's the worst spy of all time, considering she continues to use the same alias on every freaking mission. You know, in spite of the epilogue in RE3 that they've gone on to ignore, because fuck continuity of any kind, it's too hard to manage. And then there's Wesker, who shows up in four makes separate ways, and may as well just do the damn job himself if he's gonna put his boots to the ground anyway. But nah, he's gotta be a colossal idiot by letting Ada recover the sample he wants, and then casually admitting he's someday gonna unleash COVID, I mean Ouroboros, and murder the world, thereby giving Ada the opportunity to nope the fuck out like any sane person would. It's a good thing that dumb fuck could still get Krauser's Plaga too, otherwise he'd be sitting back in his chair with egg on his face wondering why he spilled the beans like generic villain number 4002. But at least the new voice actor fits that sort of bland personality. So glad to hear they're keeping him on board, by the way. Although, Capcom likes to recycle voice actors these days, so he could be voicing Sheva Alomar next for all we f know. And I for one would totally support that stunning and brave choice. Let's go ahead and get gender fluid up in this bitch. Let's sink this ship in style, boys and girls. Oh, uh, oops, my ist and phobe is showing again. Send in the cancel pigs and take me away. Alright, alright, I'll tone it down a little, but on the topic of voice actors, man, Capcom's decisions have been especially boneheaded when it comes to English VAs. In a series where they give their characters radical redesigns so often, a consistent voice is important to ensuring fans can continue to connect with and recognize those characters. But nah, screw it. So-and-so joined a union or asked for ten bucks more than last time, so let's just step outside and hire the next person we see instead. Nobody will notice. Oh hey, that Joe Schmo barely cost us anything. Let's get them to voice three more characters in the sequel. Yes, I'm exaggerating to an extent, but not by much. Like, okay, Roger Craig Smith wasn't the first voice of Chris Redfield, but they did keep him around for a stretch of, what, six or seven games, maybe? After voicing the villain of Degeneration for a couple minutes. But let's face it, those CGI movies are just pointless fluff in the grand scheme of things. Let's just Put a pin in that for now. Point is, they had a good thing going with Roger Craig Smith, but they ditched him in favor of Kevin Dorman for Vendetta and Death Island. An actor who had just played Chris once immediately before Roger in Umbrella Chronicles. And between Vendetta and Death Island, Dorman was replaced by David Vaughn in RE7, who was then replaced by Jeff Shine as Chris in RE8, even though Shine had just played Carlos, the second playable protagonist of RE3 Remake the year prior. Did I lose you? Pretty sure I lost myself. So let me simplify and reframe it. Going from Roger Craig Smith's final performance as Chris, which was technically Revelations 2. Between just 2015 and 2023, one character was voiced by four people. That's unnecessary. The way they handle who voices their characters, at least in the English versions, isn't just mismanagement. It also gives us some insight on how little they care about Resident Evil. And that's how they handled Chris freaking Redfield, the character with the most appearances throughout the series and often represents it in various crossover projects. Never mind all the recurring characters. Man, they really turned Chris into an absolute moron for Village, didn't they? But hell, I need to set aside three hours to talk about my complaints about Village alone, so I'll just try to hit the highlights of that game's stupidity. Mm. Big titty vampire, but not a vampire dummy mommy who turns into a f***ing dragon, 
who you briefly attack with an apparently legendary knife that can kill anything because shut up, Capcom said so, which then gets chucked into an endless chasm to never again see the light of day because it opens up a whole new world of future plot problems if it doesn't immediately disappear, such as, Oh no, a new enemy, what will we do? I know, we'll stab it with the knife that can kill anything. Now let's go get some shawarma for lunch. Oh, but yeah. Honorable mention to the totally not a vampire Dami Mommy's daughters who are also not vampires, but are, in fact, clusters of flies that have Voltron together to form fake vampire t***s, including somehow simulating clothing and rusty metal weapons. That's Twilight and Harry Potter fanfiction levels of dumb bullshit, and yet it's only one aspect of the game. You also have knockoff Nick Cage as Hobo Magneto, who brilliantly decides to stockpile the exact kind of metal that can kill him, and... Never mind his whole part of the game is full of monsters Capcom ripped off from a direct-to-DVD horror movie because they have no shame. And then there's the endless stupidity of the Ethan plot twist. He died back in RE7, oh wow, that makes so much sense, except, you know, for the part where he was in BSAA custody for a while, and he and Mia would be quarantined and tested for a very long time, but they somehow didn't notice he was made from mold. Because he was. He was mold. A freaking mold golem, basically, and just... Nobody noticed. A mold golem that Mia was apparently very happy to fuck, by the way, which we know because they have a Super Saiyan mold baby. A character I will now not discuss further because fuck it, you can't make me. But oh yeah, I said I'd talk a little about those CGI movies, and I mean a little. <sighs> Look, I enjoyed Degeneration when it first came out. It was the first time we had seen Claire in a while, and she was paired with Leon again for a story featuring the T-Virus and G-Virus. Sounds good on paper, but it's ridiculously bland, and aside from establishing Claire works for TerraSave, absolutely nothing of consequence happens in that plot. I remember originally getting excited for the tease at the end that showed Tricell getting a sample of the G-Virus, but we know that went absolutely nowhere. Damnation was pretty much the perfect sequel to OG RE4. It was cheesy, dumb, and over the top, but to me that's much more tolerable in movie form for a short runtime. JD can die in a fire, but I like a few tidbits, like Las Plagas being used to control liquors for guerrilla warfare. That's about as nice as I can be to this one. Vendetta was shit. we all agree, right? A knockoff, platinum-haired Wesker kidnapping Rebecca because she just happens to look like his dead wife. <laughs> what a great idea! 10 out of 10 writing, truly! Then you've got bootleg Bane and blonde Blood Rain running around in ridiculous leather get-ups. Plus all the action scenes play out like the director desperately wanted to make a John Wick movie and decided to turn Vendetta into a sizzle reel, without realizing his gunfights resemble little kids playing cops and robbers while making pew-pew sounds with their mouths. Enough said on that one. Infinite Boredom was infinite and for the life of me, I can't remember anything that happened in it, aside from a tidal wave of rats and some lame monologuing non-stop about terror or some Actually, no. The, uh, the only noteworthy thing was Claire and Leon having a falling out at the end. And that definitely shook the series to its foundation. Oh, wait. Actually, it didn't end up mattering in the least. And then... <laughs> and then Death Island, which was the final nail in the coffin for my Resident Evil fandom. Let's bring most of the franchise's iconic characters together. Some of them being on screen together for the first time ever just so they can barely acknowledge each other and then speak like a bunch of robots when they do interact. I could swear this script was written by AI, but then that would actually come across like a compliment to the brain-dead translators who also worked on it. Worked in quotations, in case you couldn't pick up. Gotta love how the zombies learned parkour. I also enjoyed how the screenwriter needed to separate Jill from Chris and Claire so she could meet Leon underground, but couldn't figure out how to do it, so he just simply typed, Duh, and then the floor collapses and Jill jumps into the hole. Followed immediately by Jill unleashing her foo skills because, God help me, she's even more insufferable here than she was in 3Make. She even has the ability to jump into water without getting wet, so truly, she is the chosen one. But hey, if you ever wanted to see Leon and Chris touch butts, here you go, you f***ing weirdos. I'm just gonna skip past the missed opportunities with these characters interacting, because honestly, I didn't expect any of that to be good anyway, so it's not quite disappointing. What does bother me is that they wasted Alcatraz Island as a setting. It wasn't used particularly well here. In fact, I wouldn't blame you for forgetting after a while that it even takes place on Alcatraz. At the very least, something cool could have been done with it. 
I'm imagining a game set on Alcatraz where you're just an average Joe on the tour. Suddenly zombies or B.O.W.s pop up and all hell breaks loose, kind of like the start of the movie, but you know, not dumb. Throughout the game, you discover Alcatraz has a long history of being used for evil deeds. Not by Umbrella, though. And does Tricell even exist anymore? Maybe I'd go for something like HCF or even the connections. Point being, after making your way through the prison, solving puzzles and killing or avoiding monsters for some fun in the style of RE meets the suffering, you find a massive series of labs and containment cells under the island where prisoners were being experimented on for decades, with government funding maybe for funsies. BOWs that were created and bred underground escaped and made it to the surface, and blah blah blah, etc etc. The main characters would basically be trying to survive long enough for help to come to the island, only to eventually find out the local government is in on it and is currently isolating and quarantining the island in an effort to keep their secrets and not attract the attention of the BSAA. I don't really feel like speculating anymore, because there's no point now. Fleshing out that idea would be almost as pointless as this rant, so screw it. You see what I mean, though. It could have been a cool game, but instead Alcatraz was used for a lame-ass movie. Eh. Hell, I still kind of wish my ideal Resident Evil spinoff existed too. And yes, this is a shameless plug for that video. Go watch it if you haven't already. Link in description. Unless I don't remember, in which case, f*** it. How the hell did I get on this topic? Oh, right, those CGI movies. Yeah, nothing important happens in them. You could skip them entirely and be no worse off for it. The stories don't matter, and as far as we should all know by now, the characters will just reset to whatever state Capcom wishes the next time they're used somewhere. Don't waste a penny on them. Ever. And now I've talked about them way more than I ever wanted to, dammit. But you know what? Somebody out there will say I'm just hating on the new stuff. Nah, <laughs> sorry. I just critique things objectively. I do love the older games, especially the fixed camera classics, but they're far from perfect. Far. Let's take my favorite game. Remake. My favorite game of all time, in fact. I love it dearly. It's my comfort game, the one I fire up when I'm feeling down. But why is Jill falling on her ass in every cutscene? Her backstory has her being in the army and also trained by Delta Force, which is ridiculous, but it is what it is, go with it. It's okay to show her being scared, like in the intro and the opening dining hall section with Barry. Everyone's dealing with zombies and monsters for the first time. It makes sense. But after that, she should probably have her shit together. Of course, RE3 make took things too far in the other direction to the point of absurdity. I also enjoy Zero a lot, but man is it deeply flawed. The characterization of Rebecca does not match at all with Remake or even OG RE1 in any way. You can headcanon that away with the PTSD excuse, but come on, it's a major stretch. But more than that, and this is something I've discussed with someone else at length, Billy is a problem. I like him, don't get me wrong, always have. But he shouldn't exist. Zero should have been Bravo Team's game. Rebecca should have been teamed up with Richard throughout the game. That way you learn more about him, appreciate him, and it'd ultimately make his death and remake even more impactful. They did eventually do a Richard and Rebecca team up in Umbrella Chronicles, but that's not close to what I'm talking about. But anyway, Zero should have been a showcase of Bravo Team in general. They were just red shirts in the original game and remake, and even after Zero, they just continue to be red shirts with no notable character traits. It's a wasted opportunity and a pretty pointless prequel even if I do have fun playing the game. At least the Wesker and Birkin lore is interesting. The biggest shame with the Resident Evil series is that there was never a singular voice guiding it. Someone looking to tell a consistent story, keeping a through line going for the series. There maybe could have been, if not for Shinji Mikami. Resident Evil was never meant to be campy or goofy. That's the big lie. Everyone involved with its development was disappointed by how the game turned out. Subscribe for more like this, especially the live-action FMVs. And they were also embarrassed by the English translation, because of course they were. The only thing any of them had any real confidence in was the gameplay, and Mikami was convinced that they made a legitimately terrifying game, which, yeah, fair enough. It's just a shame that the presentation of the story flopped so hard, and in fact made people laugh so much. RE1 was a train wreck that just happened to perform well when it released. And even Mikami was left promising customers that they would do better next time. And to be fair, they did. RE2 was a better game all around, in spite of its own behind-the-scenes issues. And even brought in a movie screenplay writer to handle the story. But RE1 was never able to reach its full potential, primarily because, depending on who you believe, 
The game's scenario and character planner, who wrote the story and all of the files found in the game, was fired by Mikami over jealousy. This is something I may talk about later, it is an interesting topic, but yeah, the final game supposedly only featured half of the scenario he wrote, and even that was gutted and futzed with. And yes, he was also severely disappointed by how the FMVs turned out. And like I said, Mikami just shit-canned the guy over jealousy, and didn't even have the decency to include him in the game's credits. Even though, as I said, the files he wrote, the character backstories and everything, was intact and made it to the final game. Am I saying RE1 sucks? No, not at all. There's a reason it sold well. There's a reason it's beloved. And yes, unintended as it may be, there is very much a so-bad-it's-good quality to how the story is presented. And it's great! The fun thing is, ever since Remake released, people have been free to pick their preferred flavor of that scenario. For the longest time, I wanted the darker and more serious expanded version. So I stuck exclusively with Remake. As I get older, I find myself appreciating the atmosphere of OG RE1 and the jankiness of its script and voice acting. Both have their place. But I'll always be curious what RE1 and the series as a whole could have been. It's fair to say I hate the direction it's gone in these last few years. The scales are tipped, there's no changing the fact that I dislike the RE series more than I like it. So basically what I'm doing here is saying my final piece as I lay my inner Resident Evil fan to rest. I'll always love the bits I love, but the series isn't for me anymore. I don't feel compelled to force myself to play or experience each new installment just because. I'm not interested in speculating on future plot points or what my favorite characters will get up to because frankly I don't care anymore. It's not like anyone at Capcom has a cohesive plan that makes theory crafting fun. A doesn't link to B naturally. It's more like A goes to Z goes to K goes to I and then to B, but then B is a little bit up and squiggly. I am a master of analogies, let me tell you. And for those subscribers of mine who wondered why I never reviewed Four Makes Separate Ways or Death Island, that's why. I don't run a Resident Evil channel. That, that's never what this was. You'll see RE-related videos from me when I have a passion for them. Whether it's a loving passion or a hateful passion. I won't be forcing myself into it anymore. And in my downtime, I've been expanding my skill set to finally be able to make the kind of content I've always wanted to make. I'm excited about what's coming, and I feel no need to rush. Passion is driving this channel now. If something captures my imagination and inspires a loving tribute or documentary, that's what I'll make. If something deeply insults me, I will artfully tear it to shreds for all to enjoy. Covering industry news ain't my thing, and I really never should have forced myself to. Many, many projects are in the works. Been saying it for months, and it remains true. Yes, I'm working on the second half of the Twisted Metal documentary, as well as a Gundam and Armored Core thing I released a teaser for. Indiana Jones, Tomb Raider, Ghostbusters, and other stuff are all in motion, in various stages of production. If you'd like to help fund my passions, I have a Patreon and Ko-Fi. Otherwise, I'll see you when I've got something to show. Stay tuned. And more than anything, thanks for watching and listening. I'm Baffled, and I hope to see you all next time. Bye! <laughs> and this, this was not a planned segment, but I... Seriously, have to tack this on because I'll be f if I'm not going to give my unwanted two cents on it. That cluster of shut in, reality ignoring progressives at IGN released another gem of an article about a week ago as of the time of this recording. I'm going to read the important bit and then give my thoughts. <clears throat> a whole new environmental structure and scenario design that reigns in the action and dials up the horror would bring it in line with Capcom's other remakes. But all of this doesn't account for Resident Evil 5's most notorious problem. Racism. Set in a fictional West African country, Resident Evil 5's primary antagonists are black people. Yes, technically it's the Ouroboros virus that protagonist Chris Redfield is fighting. But the Parasite's host is depicted as a nation of mobs and primitives who are violent even before their infection. Intentionally or not, Resident Evil 5 positions Africa as the Dark Continent, an uncivilized world harboring a diseased population that needs gunning down via Western intervention in the name of global security. Let's get something straight. That sentence should have ended at Chris is fighting Ouroboros, because everything past that is made up bull skewed through your smeared wokey lens. <clears throat> This insensitive treatment of people of color was hotly debated even as early as Resident Evil 5's debut trailer, with writers such as Ungai Kroll and Steven Totillo pointing out the game's uncomfortable post-colonial imagery. 
I've never heard of that first person, and frankly, I'm fine not knowing them if they're on the side of a dumbass c**k like Stephen Totillo. If you're lucky enough to not know that name, he was a former editor-in-chief at the sinking dinghy known as Kotaku. Enough said. The arguments and think pieces continued well into the game's release window, with IGN's own former editor-in-chief Hilary Goldstein having also wrestled with the subject. Calling anything written by people like this a think piece is a lie. They all share one brain and it was lost in someone's couch cushion years ago. But that was 2009, a time when race was apparently a debate rather than a reality. In the 2020s, in a post-Black Lives Matter world, there is only one acceptable response to a white man shooting waves of Africans for an entire video game. No. Ah, yes, the pillar of morality known as Black Lives Matter. Built off the back of George, the patron saint of holding pregnant women hostage at knife point, who was killed by the orgy of drugs in his system while being rightfully arrested for breaking the law. The same Black Lives Matter who incited violent riots and encouraged mass looting, even though it actually went against their supposed beliefs by destroying POC-owned businesses because looters only cared about getting free All while claiming it's just peaceful protests, bruh. IGN's Matt Perslow is here to tell us BLM is great, guys, and they are a just and worthy cause, and everybody should follow their example. Matt Perslow, who's from the UK and presumably wasn't here to experience the violence and riots for himself, and is still very happy to comment on them as if he knows anything. Yeah, this cat is probably very happy for the founders of Black Lives Matter who used BLM donations to buy multiple mansions for themselves. Because that's a totally okay thing to do, even though that money was meant to help people within their community. But hey, it's justifiable. They did do a tour and have a dinner party that one time, so that totally counts as a good deed overall. BLM stands for Buy Luxurious Mansions, right? Okay, back to the... Remakes may be able to redefine their source material, but there's only so many changes you can make until it's not a remake at all, but an entirely different game. And if you take Africa out of Resident Evil 5, is it Resident Evil 5 anymore? Even with a vastly improved, more sensitive take on the continent, perhaps one with a black protagonist and more empathetic look at the outbreak, the experience would simply be too divorced from the original to hold the name Resident Evil 5. I certainly love that with the way people like this think. And make no mistake, Perslow is f***ed by the old Christopher Titus standard definition. Entire chunks of the world are just off limits for specific kinds of fiction. People like this, the craziest, most zealous Wokies out there, will try their damnedest to hogtie anyone trying to tell a story, if you don't tell it the exact way they want you to, and if it's about something they don't approve of. Criticizing it, isn't enough for them. They are trying to make sweeping changes to entire industries to force their f***ing insane worldviews to be the absolute standard. And if your characters are straight, or white, or don't have bad crazy made-up pronouns like Zay or Treekin or f***ing Snuffleupagus, then you shouldn't be allowed to tell that story. <laughs> you know what? Kotaku is on its way out. I wonder how much longer IGN will survive. But to close things out, toward the end of this piss stain of an article, when referring to RE4 make and a supposedly major change from the original, Perslow wanted to show his mastery over Resident Evil lore to make a point. Furthermore, the end of this scene is entirely rewritten when learning of Wesker's plans, rather than dutifully deliver the stolen Plaga sample to him, Ada betrays her shadowy boss and forces her helicopter pilot to turn around. In this moment, the future of Resident Evil becomes unclear. Capcom has given itself the freedom to do whatever it wants. I just hope it's not a remake of Resident Evil 5. Um, you should know this scene as you supposedly played the game. Ada never gave Wesker the proper sample in OG RE4. Wesker's dominant plaga always came from Krauser's corpse. That was true in the original, and it's still true in the remake. If you're going to claim that you know what you're talking about, and also claim to be a game journalist, maybe do some f***ing research before you talk out of your ass. You know what? Maybe give up on the game's journalism thing. You're a bitch, shit.